G'day, I'm here at uh, Rockhampton for Beef Week with Stuart Austin. He's very patient. I've got myself a new bit of technology and uh, I'm such a muppet. Um, Stuart, <laughs> thank you for your time. Um, your story is fascinating, I find, because a lot of the, the, the farmers that I interview um, have been on the family farm pretty much all the time, have a number of you know things take place and then they change their direction, they do something something else. You know, and they and they whoa, and they head down that regenerative regenerative far, farming path. Yep. Yours is quite different. Could you tell me what you're doing now, like what you're currently doing, and we'll weave in your story after that. Yep. yep. So we're uh, managing a place at Ebor, um, called Wilmot. Uh, it's about four and a half thousand acres on the Ebor Dorigo Plateau. Um, it's an extraordinary soil base, mm. volcanic basalt soil. Um, at 4,000 feet above sea level and uh, about 52 inch rainfall. So it's a pretty wow. special. That's twice the, what Boora gets. Pretty special block of dirt. Uh, five waterfalls on the farm, um, you know, two really good water systems through it. Uh, so we manage that for an investor. Um, it's an extraordinary block and we're basically uh, steer trading and grass finishing operation. Um, we turn over three to five thousand steers a year. Wow. Um, and the business, the company also owns another place at Wilco that's uh, a breeding block with about seven or eight hundred cows. So. And you're running that holistically, there's, there's uh, yes. a bit of an overlay of that? Yep, so two or three years before we got there, uh, the previous manager kicked that into gear, mm -hmm. the rotational grazing. Um, started to split a few paddocks up, uh, put a few more waters in, and when we got there we kept that going. Um, and quite high density. Where, yes. you know, we max them all about at about 1,800 head, which in some of our paddocks is almost 80 head back. Um, wow. So, we've, you know, we're typically running... Good herd, uh, herd impact there. Terrific. Um, yeah, well. We've been soil testing there for seven years, and um, soil carbon's gone from 2.3 to about 5 in that time. Um, um, that's significant. I'm sure most of our viewers will appreciate the significance of that. Because yeah. most, well, not most, but a lot of farmers are going back. And it's and the fact that we know that you know like that we've measured that. Yep. Good objective data. Yep. And it's um, and it's uh, and the density is what's changed that. We've had a there's a lime program there. We've, it's, uh, we've been putting a fair bit of lime on to um, reduce our aluminium and unlock phosphorus and, and sort of move more towards a neutral pH. Mm -hmm. um, so that between the lime and the hooves, that's basically what's what's changed our soil there. That's the input. Yeah. Yep. And there's a there's a soil test, a CSIRO, there's a report that I've read from, the 19, from 1960, uh, and it was at 6% soil carbon then. So to know that we're at 5 now, and we, you know, we can still improve So it was that. 6 in the 1960s, we went back to 2.5. Yep, and now we're back to about 5. Yeah, wow. Um, you know, the, the rainfall and the climate has certainly helped us do that quickly. Yes. Uh, but, but what's important is that it is achievable. You know, we talk a lot about soil carbon and, and the, you know, the need to improve it. Um, the fact that we, we did those soil tests back then, we've been doing it every year since, so we can see that change over time, mm -hmm. and we know, you know that, that's what we can achieve. Because so, that's one of those that's things... That's the exciting part about it, that's for sure. Well, yeah, and it's exciting for you, and it's exciting for others to know that it can be done. Yeah, exactly. And a yeah. lot of, you know, um, you know, doesn't... You know, farmers, some are not as scientific as others, but there are others that really need that objective data yep. to convince them, and that's fine. And you've got it. So yep. that's really inspiring stuff. Yeah, exactly. Um, Stuart, tell me about, because again, your background was not family farm all the way to a point and then changing and then on you go. You you were had, you on a family farm for some time, but you spent a lot of time away doing other, yeah. other things, working for other people. Yep. You also, I know you also did GFP, it's grazing for profit um, with RCS. Yep. Um, tell me about that, why you did it, and, and given what you were doing, and, 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 and what that allowed you then to do. Yep. So, yeah, uh, my grandfather had a place in the Upper Murray, where I spent a lot of time when I was a kid. Um, it wasn't ever realistically uh, going to be a succession plan for my mother and yep. husband to, and, and dad to take that on. Uh, and there hasn't been a family farm for me necessarily to go home to. Um, which is, the blessing in that is, is that uh, I've been able to create my own destiny, basically. Mm. Um, so, 
when I finished school, spent a fair bit of time up north. And through those years, when I was about 21 or two, I suppose, I started working for uh, Lush Lethbridge. And the Lethbridge family had been through GFP um, and the RCS executive link battling those programs mm -hmm. through the late 90s. Um, and then got to know Lux's brother Russell. Uh, so Lux was a really strong mentor for me at that period in my life, um, at that time period. Um, and, and then I got to know Russell, his brother, and their home place at Georgetown. And so that Russell then invariably became a bit of a mentor. So where did you um, say Georgetown? Where are we talking? What part of the... North Queensland. No, okay, yep, uh, sure. They've also, so they, it, and basically, and Russell, always, one thing he's always said is, um, you can't afford not to. Yeah. And so many things that were, you know, new things, innovative things, changes, uh, particularly around change, we always are so quick to find an excuse as to why we can't do it. And he, uh, and Russell has always said you can't afford not to. Yes. It's not, a, it's, not a, it's not a matter how much it's going to cost and can you afford to or not. The fact yes. is if you don't do it, it's going to cost you more. So that, that's always rung true and, um, and so seeing some of that holistic management principles, uh, particularly around the, uh, also around the fertility in their farm and cattle up there, they're using very out of the box genetics that are some of the most fertile genetics in the country mm -hmm. um, and they have been for 20 years and they've now got a very fertile cow, commercial cow. And right. they still are up there? Yep. Yeah, right, right. They're a very, um, you know, they're a happy family, they've got a bloody nice place, that, you know, it's, it's not the greatest country in the world but it's in really good ecological condition. Mm -hmm. uh, they've got a tremendous herd of very maternal farm cows and so it was a real, you know, really cemented in my mind that this is, this is where I need to be heading and this is the direction mm -hmm. I need to be going. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd always intended to do a, a graduate for profit school. Through the next sort of 10 years, I suppose, I kept coming across people, built a network, you know, out from that Lethbridge family of um, others who'd been through GFP, also, you know, solidified the family business um, financially and succession and all those sort of things um, with the help of RCS. Uh, so I'd always planned to do a GFP, but I wanted to do it when we were in a position to be able to implement it. And yeah. so at the end of 2013, um, we decided that was time to go and do it. Trish and I went and did it. Um, with well, sent you off your own bank. We did, yeah. yeah. Yep. Um, and it was a couple of years then. We had a couple of years around Catherine where we were just contracting, um, doing all sorts of different things. Uh, and it wasn't until this job came along that we were, this has sort of been our first opportunity to really implement everything we've learned. Yeah. Um, and it's been like a, yeah. Um, it's just snowball. You know, we, we've come in there. Uh, the, the system had already been put in place by the previous management, so we were able to just keep the wheels turning and keep going. Um, so we've done a little bit more development there. Uh, a lot of it has been around our own knowledge and the knowledge of our staff. So all our staff there are now done GFP. Yeah, nice. um, they've all done a low stress stock handling school. Uh, we're adamant about improving the country and the ecological condition of the farm. We're adamant about good psychology in our animals um, and and fundamentally we, you know, we've got to turn it off. It's a, it's a, um, it is owned by an investor but it's a it's got to be a fully functioning commercial business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, um, so yeah that's sort of how we came to be where we are uh, and like I say I, was, I suppose it was those people in that early period of my career mm -hmm. inspired you yeah mentored yeah um, particularly mentored yeah and I've had mentors all the way through that yep um, and still, I mean, we're talking about Tom today, who has a place at Gundy, and he, he manages that place the same way we do at Wilmot. Tom um, Archer. And uh, he'll love to know he's on Facebook now. We've got he mention. will. Um, he's going to go viral now. <laughs> uh, so he's, you know, he's been a real mentor over the last couple of years. Uh, so just on that, I mean, you've had a few. What would you, I mean, what importance does mentoring, coaching, whatever you want to call it, um, mean to you, and also in the context of the RCS sort of program? Um, I suppose like anything you, uh, people want validation that things are going to work. Mm -hmm. And so invariably, when, whether I went looking for it or not, I don't think I did, but invariably um, sought out people who were of the same train of thought. And then the fact that they had, you know, people like Russell and Tom that have got their own place, it's, it's working. They've, you saw it working. You know, they've been doing it for 20 years and yeah. you can see the benefit of it. So they must have been some of the early Adopters. It would have been in, in the nineties. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. And so, and, I, and I've been following RCS and obviously Terry for a long time as well. And, yes. Uh, the knowledge and the information that comes out of that business, um, it's, you know, through all forms of media now, um, it just keeps that learning process going. And then through that, you, you start to grow the network through the whole social media. And, uh, and I 
advice. And I guess I've always been a mentor-driven person. Yes. Um, I've always appreciated that bit of guidance and a bit of steering. I'm fairly um, optimistic and uh, like to consider myself a bit of a get-shit-done sort of person. And there's accountability there too, isn't it? Yeah. You know? yeah. Um, so, th and there's times when you just need a bit of moderation, a bit of a steady influence to say that's a good idea or that's not. Yes. Uh, you know, a little bit of validation that yes, that is right. Oh, it's Malcolm Turner. <laughs> we'll hang up on him. He can wait. He can wait. <laughs> it is.